but the rest of the world, first of all, there's so much inertia, the climate's going to warm even if the whole world behaves perfectly. And what's worse is people in other countries and other, and other continents will probably continue behaving poorly. And so in a way it's a, it's a two-edged sword for, for education because you say to them, don't cut the forest and the climate won't warm. Well, guess what? If they don't cut the forest, the climate's still going to warm. So in a way, it's a very frustrating phenomenon that affects conservation, but on a local level, there's nothing you can do to stop it. I agree. There's a depressing one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very depressing one. So, so, you know, like what happens if you use these graphs in conservation planning? It's, it's pretty hard to make sense of it, right? The point I'm trying to impart here is that they need to be intermediaries, right? We can't simply just look at the IPCC's fifth assessment report and sort of say temperature anomalies are expected to rise by, you know, four degrees by 2100. What does that mean? If you look at the rainfall anomalies, it doesn't look like Ethiopia is going to get wetter, but it's going to become warmer. What's the periodicity of this? Remember I asked Lee about the grid cells? This is how big a grid cell is. This is on, on, the, on the global climate model. The, re, the downscaled regional climate models will get you down to, I think, maybe half that. But if you're planning for conservation in southern Ethiopia, how do you make sense of that? It's pretty difficult, right? So there's a big gap between even though the biologists and the climate change scientists are doing the stuff on the scenario modeling and predictions, the interpretation of that for local areas is a huge gap. <coughs> and so it's something that we have to think for in our planning 10 years, 20 years, 30 years out. What will downscaled or regional climate models mean for local protected areas? Right? Are we expecting the periodicity of drought and flood to increase? Are we expecting the overall average precipitation increase? Are there particular months for which the precipitation is more likely to be more unreliable? Right? Those little pieces of information go a long way. So when it comes to conservation planning, it's not that we don't have information. It's about making that information accessible. Mona. Point here that those very large uh, squares you see they represent the general circulation model outcome. So let's imagine uh, one general circulation model out uh, outcome says the temperature will rise by 1.5 degrees right. in in uh, sorry just a moment in this cell it will rise by 1.5. Uh, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we have a rather large, large block that says in 2016 the temperature will rise by this much. But then what we do is we take the current temperature data we have, which is at a fine, much finer resolution than this thing, and we'll apply that 1.5 increase to all those cells that are all those temperature cells for, from present that represent that, that block. So in the end we have if we start with present data that is at one kilometer resolution, future data will also be at one kilometer resolution, the actual you know, minimum temperature for 2000, or actually maximum temperature for 2016, uh, 2060. What is coarse is that general circulation model, that climate model. Right. So. Yeah. Well, which is to say we can downscale we can down global model outputs. And get right. to a re resolution that's at least a bit more relevant than this. Right. right. And those are quite freely accessible. In fact, there's a layer on Google Earth that you can simply add on to, to the whole globe that says predicted temperature 2050. Very easy. And you can zoom in at those finer scale cells. Point here I'm trying to say again the data is available, its accessibility is not so available. Right? Um, 
so you know from Lee's lecture there's movement upslope but also based on aspect you know we talked about southern facing slopes north south facing slopes east west facing slopes um, interpretation can be difficult you have to merge it with multiple data sets this often takes a lot of time and effort um, it's not an easy process but one that you know we should continue to to look for um, again in critical monitoring of long-term data one of the often th one of the things that we find is that existing records seem to be there somewhere but when we go and ask for them they're like I, I don't know who has that data I know it was collected but I don't know who has that data right and that's particularly problematic so this goes back to the the lectures that Lee was uh, the, that Tom was talking about with the sorry <laughs> with the digital accessible knowledge right if we can get data on for example the the red wolf sightings in Bali and that is standardized and it's put up on the web great then other researchers can continue on to build on that as long term data sets right but often there is that problem of getting making that data available sometimes there are proprietary issues you may be going on to say this in a moment but let me build on what you just said not only should you look for the data and and create the data but there should be an explicit baseline <coughs> and periodic updates to the baseline which mm -hmm. is to say if I make you know Mike, the, the conservator of the, I don't know, Mount Cameroon National Park. What I would love to see him do is first compile all existing knowledge, be it digital, be it accessible, be it integrated or not, but compile all the existing knowledge of biodiversity relevant to that park. So that will give us a baseline that probably extends maybe from 1900 or the 1880s to present. Some places, sometimes in places will be better represented, sometimes in places will not be represented. I would then like to see Mike do a 2016 baseline. Can't do all taxa, can't do the whole park. But imagine setting up crucial monitoring sites crucial points where you go in and you document everything. Plants, key animal groups, key plant groups. Um, and then part of the management plan should actually be to redo those baselines. Thanks. Because you know what, what Lee showed you was some expectations like movement up slope. And he showed you some model results that are dependent on the climate models, on the ecological niche models that, that we use to get those projections, they're not necessarily right. Hmm. So let's go out and build data that you and your successors as the conservator of that park can use to make real crucial hands-on management decisions. So. One thing I don't think I've ever seen in a park management plan is that of updating the information yep. resources. Right. And too frequently, what you see is that protected areas become information vacuums, which is to say mm -hmm. it's so hard to work in a national park that all the scientists go and work elsewhere. <laughs> and so the place you know the least about is the place you care the most about. And that is extremely common. Think about how much harder it is to get the permit to do the biodiversity studies inside the park versus outside the park. Mm. Yeah, I think Fikirta and I were just talking about that. Mm -hmm. I think, what is it, $1,000 a, a, a year for foreign researchers research per, year. per research project per year? Yeah. Sorry. No, that's great. Almost done here. I know you're all sleepy. Here, here's my, bi my second big takeaway point. You got to learn to think outside the box. And this is one of the most difficult things to do because you are trained to think according to how you got your education. 
I was trained to think this way. But that training is not necessarily relevant for what is going to happen 20, 30, 40, 50 years out. Knowledge takes a long time to accumulate and the very nature of science is predicated on paradigm shifts. Something will work for so long until somebody comes and disproves that this was not right. And they will take over that paradigm until somebody else comes along and takes it over. So be incredibly flexible about your, what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept. Back up your claims, but learn to think outside the box for those future challenges. Okay, the end. From me, thank you. You guys have been great students. Very proud of all of you. Uh, I think I speak for all the instructors and everyone else who's involved in the course. We're very proud with what you've, w what you've accomplished and how patient you've been. And although I would have liked a little bit more energy from some of you, <laughs> uh, keep being critical and never accept the dominant narrative as truth. Thank you.